So, hi, good, uh, good evening. Um, it was fun catching up on all the weather um, around, the, around the U.S. here. Um, today's uh, presentation, we'll go, we'll go around the room here and have a quick round of introductions, but um, just to remind us, since it's been a while since we got together as a group, um, and that's probably more for the researchers than it is for the teachers, I presume. Uh, anyway, um, we're really excited to kind of catch up with all of you and find out um, where and what you've been up to since your expedition and how you're using um, the expedition or what your plans are in your um, upcoming classes or with the audiences that you work with. So that's kind of what our focus is tonight is to uh, just kind of catch up with you all and see where you're where you're headed and what you do what you're doing and then also how Arcus can um, help you out. And um, for the researchers that have joined us today, we asked all the educators to send a slide. So they'll be sharing a slide with us. Um, I have all the slides so no one has to share their desktop. I'll share my desktop with you and you could just talk through your slide. Um, might be the easiest way. Um, but before we do that, I just wanna go virtually around the room. Please say who you are and where you went and with if you're a researcher, which teacher and teacher with which, or educator with which researcher. So Janet and Judy were self-explanatory. Um, you all know us. Uh, Steve, you're the, at the top of my group. And you're muted. You have to unmute yourself, Steve. Uh, I'm Steve Oberbauer. I uh, was hosting, we were hosting Ali at Barrow, Atkasuk, and Tulik. Uh, I didn't overlap with her when she left for Tulik. But uh, I'm Steve Oberbauer, and I'm a professor of biology at Florida International University down in Miami, Florida, where the weather is gorgeous. Nice. And the right. tourists are getting here in big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> that time of year. Um, Ali. Hi, I'm Ali Martinez and I teach in Eagle Pass, which is in Texas on the border with Mexico. Um, I teach seventh grade science and I went out into the field with Steve and Jeremy. Um, we were in Barrow and, and uh, Tulik and looking at vegetation. All right, thank you. Uh, Sarah. I'll just have you introduce yourself. Sorry. That's okay. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, many hats at the moment, I suppose. So work with y'all doing informal science educator liaisoning and going to do more of that as we follow up after your expedition. Right now, I'm helping with all the selection process. Well, this week. Uh, literally right now I'm ironing because I was in Alaska all summer. We're back in Idaho and Jeremy will know that I'm wearing the same clothes as yesterday. So <laughs> I, need, I need to do my ironing. Okay, you iron. <laughs> uh, Kate, steeper. Uh, so yeah, hi, my name is Kate. Um, I uh, am from Southern California. I teach 10th grade chemistry. I went up to Tulik with um, Doni. And um, we were also studying vegetation, and um, now I'm now I'm back dealing with the, the rain today. Okay, and it looks like Jeremy, you're next. I'm Jeremy May. I'm a postdoc at Florida International University uh, with Steve, and I went up with Ale and at Barrow, Akasuk, and Tulik. Uh, yeah, doing veg stuff. All right, Lee. Uh, Lee Cooper. I'm at Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is part of the University of Maryland, and Piper Bartlett-Brown and uh, was with us on the Healy this summer uh, in the uh, Bering and Chukchi Seas. Very good. I nice see you. Uh, Katie. Hi, uh, I'm Katie Gavanis. I'm an informal educator in Homer, Alaska, but I'm actually currently in Washington State, um, so I'm I'm missing from work right now, um, or actually I'm working remotely. And um, I went on the first leg of the Mosaic expedition in the central Arctic Ocean with Anna Gold. And the overall expedition is looking at kind of changing sea ice dynamics and how that couples with the atmosphere and the ocean and the biology in the Arctic Ocean. 
and I was most involved with setting up uh, the atmospheric equipment, which was really interesting. Yeah, you, well, we'll hear more about you in a moment, but we're literally, you got back very recently, so glad to see your face after chatting with you virtually for so long. <laughs> uh, DJ. Hi everyone, my name is DJ Cast. I run K through 12 STEM education programs for low income students in Los Angeles. And I went with Dr. Byron Crump uh, in 2016 up to Tulip looking at microbial biogeography. All right, oh, and popping in, uh, we have Anna. Anna. Hi, sorry for being a few minutes late. Um, you're just you saying wanna... hi and who you are and who you went with it. Great. Um, I'm Anna Gold. I'm from the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I um, was on the Mosaic Expedition together with Katie Gavanos. All right. Welcome. Um, I see your face too. Uh, Doni. See if the video works. Yeah, this is Doni Bradhart. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and also a vegetation person and so we were looking at nitrogen fixing shrubs and the relationship between them and soils and I worked with Kate this summer. Very good, nice to see you. Um, let's see, boy people keep moving around on my little screen here. Uh, Piper, I think you're next. Hi, uh, I'm Piper Bartlett Brown. I work at St. Thomas Aquinas High School in Dover, New Hampshire, teaching high school science. And, and I was out with Lee Cooper in the Chukchi Sea this summer, uh, looking at the effects of sea ice decline and warming sea temperatures on benthic organisms. Very good. And uh, DJ. I already went, unless there's oh, another. You went. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Like I said, everybody's moving around. Um, Dominique. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, I'm Dominique Richardson. I am an informal educator at Cabrillo Marine Aquarium in Los Angeles, California, um, and I mentor middle school and high school students on independent research projects. And I am a 2014-2015 alum. I went with uh, Frank Dietschy to East Antarctica to look at um, ice sheet dynamics. Ooh, cool. All right. So I think you should all be, uh, if you're on the screen tonight, or uh, not by phone, and have oh. have, a, have good video, you sh should be seeing my, um, my desktop. And you all just kind of minimized in my world. So now I can't see you very well. But um, anyway, uh, this is um, the beginning of the uh, presentation. And so I just wanted to put this into, uh, put the title slide out there. So we have it in the recording. But um, again, thanks everybody for joining. Tonight we're missing, uh, for educators, we're missing David, Amanda, and Monica. And, um, but we do, have a little bit of feedback from um, at least two of them, I believe, that we'll share with you. So uh, this is just a reminder of mostly for the um, researchers of where you can find some of the things that um, the educators will be presenting today. So we ask them to produce STEM experience reports and they should, you should be seeing these if you haven't already. Um, these are reports that um, the educators put together about their experience and has different uh, questions about how it impacts them, how they're going to use this experience, and um, kind of some of the highlights of the research. And these get produced and put on the Polar Trek website, and um, they are also tagged with the expedition. So you can find them underneath the expedition as well as under the product section of uh, Polar Trek website. And we use these and send these out to the funders. So NSF looks at these as well. Um, and you can also use them for um, reporting purposes um, in your research um, awards as well. And then also any products, especially like lesson plans, um, 
that get produced as uh, a result of this expedition, those will start showing up under the learning resources. Um, and anything actually that the educator produces, journals, photos, articles that are, are affiliated with the research um, and these other types of products, they're all tagged with the expedition page. So or with the expedition. So one key place to look and get all that material is under the expedition. You'll see the range of products that are being produced. So just a place um, that you can gather information for your reports. Um, before we get into presentation tonight, this is just the flyer that just shows where everybody is um, or who everybody is and where they all went. Um, if any of you need this uh, for presentations, uh, please let Judy and myself know and we can give you um, an updated version. Um, and then for tonight, uh, we're gonna go around the room and have you present. And I'd like it, you know, for you to keep your video on when you're talking to us about your slide. Um, I know that Katie and and Anna might have to leave somebody, um, Judy just relayed some information about that and that you needed to present first, if you could. Um, otherwise, they're in order of, of deployment. Um, opposite order of deployment, actually. Oh, opposite, oh, sorry. I got that all backwards, who knows? I, my brain just came back from Hawaii and it's not really functioning very well. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going opposite. <laughs> Anyway, we'd like you to explain a little bit, um, starting with the educator, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about your slide, your expedition, and we had asked you to discuss um, some of the key outreach activities that you did. So, um, and then I also, in an email to everybody, I had some discussion points, but we'll get to those towards the end when we aren't um, after the slides. So really, it's just kind of telling us about your expedition and some of the highlights. Uh, where you went and some of your outdoor uh, or outdoor <laughs> your outreach activities that you have um, ongoing um, or did while you were out in the field. So starting with uh, Katie, um, would you like to explain your slide? Yeah, um, so Anna Gold and I and about 80 other people uh, were on the Russian not quite icebreaker, we found out, uh, <laughs> Academic Fedorov. It's an ice class vessel, but technically not an icebreaker. Um, for about six weeks, uh, we were accompanying the other icebreaker involved, a polar stern, into the central Arctic Ocean, and the polar stern is still there, which was the intention. Um, there, the idea is that they'll be kind of moored to the sea ice, and then eventually it's, it, well, it has now frozen in around them and they'll drift with the sea ice over the next year and be kind of a floating um, observatory for sea ice research as well as I mentioned in the introduction kind of the way that sea ice um, is connected and influences the atmosphere and the ocean and the biology and then in turn how the atmosphere and the ocean and the biology influence the sea ice um, and so it's a pretty exciting expedition um, it's sort of one of its kind it hasn't had something like this hasn't happened in a long time and probably won't happen for a long time again this magnitude and this duration and this kind of geographic scale um so it was really exciting to be a part of it and um what anna and i were involved in on the fedorov and the other folks on the fedorov were um, helping to set up the distributed network so the the mosaic ice flow and the polar stern have gotten a lot of attention and that makes sense. That's going to have researchers there throughout the year um, doing science out on the ice and sleeping on, on the ship basically. Um, but surrounding that is a distributed network. And so there are three major sites that have about um, four to six ocean, uh, ocean and ice instruments and atmosphere setups on them um, as well as some Sorry. more uh, smaller sites around that. So there's this massive distributed network that extends about 50 kilometers in all directions from the main mosaic ice camp. Um, and so we were involved in helping set that up. And that was a really cool opportunity because we actually got to kind of travel around more through the, through the sea ice and be involved in kind of observing how they chose the ice flows to set up on 
and then it was a good opportunity as well to um, get to know the different um, research teams that were setting up the dis different aspects of the distributed network. And um, Anna's, uh, Anna, do you want to talk a little bit more about kind of the the Met sled and the atmosphere piece? Since mm -hmm. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Explain uh, it better, probably. Yeah. Um, so, and on this slide, you can see here are, um, are some of the people involved. And on the right hand side, it's um, is some of these instruments and the science team. Um, you can see the on the upper hand corner this. Um, a construct with the beams in all directions. We call it a MET sled, meteorological sled, uh, home built actually in my backyard here at the <laughs> NOAA building. It was parked on the, my kids were playing on it all summer. Um, <laughs> it's not my personal, it was these, the scientists built this, but, um, <laughs> and uh, it has, it's essentially an, um, has it's the basis for a lot of instrumentation that is measuring um, the energy budget. So there are instruments uh, measuring incoming and outgoing short wave and long wave radiation. It's um, measuring um, meteorological parameters. And so these sleds are um, connecting the atmosphere piece that Katie talked about. And then there's ocean buoys uh, were installed just behind us. You can see here, I think in the back, there's something yellow. Mm -hmm. um, there's, that's I think a non-installed ocean buoy in the background there. And there's, um, so it's all these different pieces are measured at the same, on the same flow that's drifting along with the central observatory. And down here on the right-hand corner, you can see the scientists that were involved in the deployment and um, some of the students, there were graduate students on the ship also that were involved in, in setting up and just being part of this Arctic expedition. Cool. And so Anna and I, we just got back about, physically we got back about three weeks ago. I think mentally we're both just, we just kind of came up and had a call yesterday to sort of finally process through and, and get ready for the next steps. Um, so we, we were doing a lot of things on board despite very, very limited connection to the outside world. Um, and then we have a lot coming up in, in the next, next month. Um, and I think I'll let Anna talk a little bit more about Mosaic Mondays as well. Um, but I'll talk about the other things first maybe. Um, so for, for me, I'm an informal educator in Alaska, and I'm really interested in place-based learning, uh, which is interesting to then go to a place that most people will never, ever, ever get even close to. Um, so I was thinking a lot beforehand, and then especially on the ship, about ways to connect um, students' local communities with the experience um, that I had in the Arctic, and also just to make it a little bit more um, kind of concrete and, and hands-on and, and these processes that are really, really abstract, how to make them accessible for students um, when for many of them, not all of the students I work with, but for many of the students I work with, um, something like sea ice is a totally kind of foreign concept. And so on board and afterwards, I've been working um, with on my own and with a number of researchers and graduate students to think through possibilities for games and experiments and outdoor activities that can um, be built into the unit curricula that they're creating at uh, the University of Colorado through series, um, but also be offered to um, through Polar Trek and then especially to informal educators that are thinking about incorporating more Arctic science into their, their work. Um, so it works in the K-12 setting, um, the formal setting, but also designed to be able to be something you can do with an after-school group. And in the coming months, I'll be kind of piloting those with some of our after-school groups uh, at the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies, and then hopefully have them ready to go out more broadly at that point. Um, and then similarly, really interested in kind of how to take the super intensive uh, research that's going on with these really sophisticated instruments in the Central Arctic Ocean and connect it with community-based monitoring that young people could get involved with in their, in their home communities. And so trying to take some of the existing community-based monitoring and citizen science protocols that exist out there, like through GLOBE or COCO RAS or these other programs and build a framework around them that uh, 
kind of talks with and through Mosaic um, and maybe is drawing on some of the Mosaic data to make comparisons, but also just sort of talks about how researchers might um, focus on that same parameter in, in, in the central Arctic Ocean. Um, and then another piece that I'm really excited about and that's been fun to think about so far is kind of this uh, suite of seasonal activities that can come out um, as different events happen in the Central Arctic Ocean and other places um, for environmental education centers and, and museums and aquariums and informal learning sites like that. Um, so the first set of them I sort of compiled and pulled together some things that existed, pulled together some scientific information, created a couple new or adapted activities, um, and then sent that out around the September equinox. And I'm planning to do one um, for the solstice um, and then some others along the way. I had wanted to do one for kind of the big fall migration, but that sort of coincided right with the equinox and then I was out of communication for six weeks. So. We'll have to hit the spring migration and then kind of sea ice retreat and a couple of other things um, that'll happen across the course of the year. And um, one other thing that I want to mention super quickly, uh, I don't know how much time we're supposed to take, um, but on board the Fedorov, there was a really cool opportunity. There were 20 graduate students that were there participating in kind of learning about field work, engaging in the field work, and also they had almost daily uh, lectures and presentations. And so Anna and I and the three other educators from Germany, Falk, uh, Lisa Marie, and Frederica, um, presented to the and led um, workshops for the Mosaic School graduate students about education and outreach, which was really, um, really great. And then Anna and I also worked really closely with them, um, mentoring through them through kind of brainstorming outreach and education activities that they are all doing at their home universities or home institutes. And so it was a chance to kind of amplify and um, help them become better educators or involved in better outreach, but then also get it out around the world in a pretty cool way. Um, so that was exciting. And then the Mosaic Mondays is something that um, started when we left or right before we left and um, is pretty cool and a great way to uh, get involved and Anna just put the link up there and if you haven't signed up for Mosaic Mondays I strongly encourage you to do so. Now that I'm back it's a great way to stay updated on what's going on. Yeah and thanks Katie. I um, did a great job summarizing and it's funny you've talked a lot and there are so many other things we've done on the ship. We um, we we collected a lot of um, footage and photos that we can use in curriculum that are going to be built in curriculum. And I think the, maybe the unique part about this project is that Mosaic has, uh, we have our own NSF grant to just do broader impact. So we have all these uh, curriculum development projects that are larger scale where there's a team of people working on developing curriculum around this. But those people are not going on the ship. So Katie and I collected um, footage that they need. We are also developing a MOOC around Mosaic, a massive open online course. And we collected, um, uh, did some lectures, filmed some lectures on the ship there. And, um, and so there's a lot of uh, um, happening now, just like Katie said, both through these ambassadors from the Mosaic School, through these funded efforts that we are working on, and then, um, some ongoing work that continues mo with Mosaic Monday, and then the work that Katie um, does really fits nicely in, and we can go, we have a workshop at AGU, we have a workshop at NSTA to bring this uh, all these um, materials that we developed out um, into the teacher and education world. Awesome. Yeah, you guys have been busy, but... Uh. Oh. <laughs> And you can't see it in the picture, but that, that's Flat Stanley for all the elementary teachers out there. Flat Stanley got to go out on the sea ice and on a helicopter, two helicopter rides. The bottom, the bottom uh, left, right? Is yeah, yeah. In a plastic bag, I think. Totally. And then Katie also did a, a class, a call with, uh, with a class, class in Alaska. So we did some connection as, um, Connectivity was very hard uh, to navigate, but um, there was one ship to shore connection from the ship. Yeah, I gotta say that was an amazing event, actually. <laughs> one that it lasted 
over an hour <laughs> with this supposed satellite connection. And uh, I don't know, it was, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to praise it because we did a great job. And Katie, you guys, we figured out how to communicate through WhatsApp. It was a strange way of communicating, <laughs> but it worked and <laughs> we have stuff posted. So anyway, it was all, it was all yeah, good. Yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to put together a, um, how to post a journal by WhatsApp piece. Yeah, for that yeah, it, was, it, was, it was a strange experience, but it worked, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, Katie or Anna uh, while we're sitting here? Are you in awe? I can't see you, so you have to speak up if you are have a question. Where did you get on the ship? We we got on the ship in Tromso, Norway, and we got off the ship on, in Tromso, Norway. Um, and that was actually another really interesting thing is that on the way out, we lost an hour almost every day for about nine days because we went through so many time zones. And then on the way back, we, we gained about an hour almost every day. Um, and then they, then they had daylight savings a day or, or you know, a week before we did in the U.S. And so then we got a surprise extra hour on the last day as well. And it was kind of hilarious. We were out there with our with the Russian ship, and we had switched time zones on our pace, uh, like the captain had decided. But then the Polar Stern was out there, and we met up. And when we met up, they were two hours ahead of us, and they were like next right there, uh, because they had switched time zones at a different pace than we did. It was kind of a hilarious experience. <laughs> uh, and where we coordination. Where we sort of ended up um, doing most of setting up the distributed network and where the um, ice flow started its journey or started its journey with Polar Stern was at about 85 degrees north and 134, 135 degrees west or east. I'm sorry. So when I calculated it out, I went about three quarters around the globe in in longitude from Homer to where we were hanging out. Cool. That is cool. All right. Very good. Thank you, ladies, for sharing. Uh, next up, speaking of ship based work, it looks like we have Piper and Lee. So, Piper, if you care to share your slide, that'd be great. Yeah, awesome. Um, so, Katie, sounds like an awesome trip. <laughs> um, I did follow, it looked awesome. Uh, so I was like, like I said, working with Dr. Lee Cooper up in the Chukchi Sea. We were aboard the U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the Healy, um, and our port of call was Nome. So we headed to Nome uh, at the end of July, or I did, um, to get on our ship there. Um, before I got on my ship, uh, there's a picture there with... Sorry, uh, Sorry that was me. I'm <laughs> Um, there's a picture there uh, at the kind of middle left um, with a couple of kids from Nome. Um, so I went a week early to work with an ecology explorers program um, out of the University of Alaska. Um, and we talked about climate change, the things that they're seeing. Um, we did some crab dissections and uh, some really neat just kind of marine ocean stuff. The woman who was running that was actually a reindeer epidemiologist. Um, so marine science wasn't really her forte and, and I got to go and spend a couple of, of uh, days with those students. Uh, and they made those little flags for me as part of outreach. And I took photos on the trip and posted them to the journal as many as I could. Um, and so that was kind of cool so they could see those and uh, follow along with the expedition. So that was kind of the first outreach piece um, that I did before going on my expedition. And then once we were delayed a day or two um, to get on the ship, we had some bad weather. Um, but once we got on there, we were following the Distributed Biological Observatory. So the DBO is uh, basically specific spots in the Bering and the Chukchi Sea that are chosen for their high biodiversity or high biomass. And so uh, a number of scientists go out and sample different parameters at those locations. And so Jackie uh, Grebmeyer and Lee Cooper are, are two of those folks that, that have been going out and doing that for a really long time. So they have this really great long-term data set um, on benthic organisms, which is what they're studying. 
Um, and so we went from Nome south down towards St. Lawrence Island, um, and then we went back up north to about 74, 75 degrees latitude um, for about three weeks on this ship. And uh, what we were doing is kind of two things. Um, we were taking two sets of data. So first was uh, Van Veen grabs, um, which is a 117 pound, basically Beko like grabber thing. Uh, and it basically picks up 0.1 um, meters per square or meter squared of the mud off the bottom. So we'll deploy that down, um, bring that mud up and uh, take mud samples for things like uh, harmful algal blooms um, and um, oxygen content and carbon and all that. Um, but then we would put them into a sieve, put that mud into a sieve and hose it down and um, identify and count. Well, then we would collect the organisms to be identified and counted back, uh, counted back in the lab. Uh, but we would be able to see those organisms. Uh, I think, I think we lost. Piper. Is that am I the only one? That, oh, okay, other yeah, people. No. Know, Piper, <laughs> Piper, we lost you. Did sure. we lose um, you completely? Oh. Are you on still? Is she on? Um, Doesn't look like she's on. Okay. Well, I, I maybe no, I, no, I, see, I see her, but Piper, oh. we can't hear you. Okay, I hear somebody type it to her. All right. Yes. Um, I'm back. Yes. Okay, okay, go ahead, Piper. Oh, God, technological difficulties. Um, and so the second thing that we looked at was uh, we used HAPS cores. And so these were cylinders with um, plastic inserts in them, and they would puncture, they would be sent down, and they would puncture the mud, uh, and we would get a certain um, volume of mud. And we were looking at the oxygen consumption of those organisms in that specific volume of mud. And so we were looking at it with two parameters. Um, with, so we would bring them back up to the surface and there would be an oxygen sensor on that uh, and on the uh, core. And we would basically look at two parameters, food or no food, um, and then light and dark, so warm and, and cold temperatures. And the hypothesis was that if we have warming sea temperatures, we're going to see more oxygen consumption. Um, and so that was one of the, the PhD students on the trip was studying that. So that was kind of cool to see. So those were the two things we were looking at with the benthic organisms. Um, and so, and, and, and with the DBO, like I had mentioned, it was, there were multiple, there were other scientists on the ship. Um, so there were people looking at atmosphere. We lost you again, Piper. Uh, well, what she was trying to say, I think, is we, we've got uh, atmospheric uh, scientists. We had uh, uh, mooring, so uh, uh, things that were over the winter. Oh, sea ice oh. Okay, Piper, can you? Oh. Okay, we hear you. We hear, you, hear you again. I was oh. trying to fill in while you were talk while you went away there. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, I don't know where it was the last time you heard thing you heard. Okay. Um, so there were other, other researchers on this trip, um, and people looking at atmospheric data, plankton, ocean acidification, marine mammals, birds. And so throughout all this, this whole trip, looking at all these different DBO sites, all these researchers were taking this data that kind of gave us this really great picture uh, of what is happening in the ecosystem uh, in relation to you know, sea ice decline, climate change, right, uh, raising sea temperatures. Um, and so that was really cool. And so I got to not only work primarily with this benthic team, but got to experience a lot of other types of research and collecting a lot of other types of data and how those things interconnect. Uh, so for me, one of the major takeaways that I um, had from this expedition and what I'm planning on putting uh, into use in my classroom is the interconnectedness of the, of the ecosystem with these different pieces. And so um, well, I'm working on a number of curriculum pieces uh, that manipulate data um, that we collected in the field. So one of the things that is that the DBO does have a website with data and Lee also has uploaded uh, a number of videos that they've taken in previous expeditions of the benthic seafloor. And so I'm hoping to use those um, 
data pieces to create curriculum so that high school students can manipulate it and look at different parameters. And there is a DBO website, but our kind of our main focus right now for this is organizing it in a way that it's user friendly for teachers and can be used by at least high school classrooms right now and then hopefully working with some other educators to um, make it K through 12 friendly. And so there are a lot of videos and pictures and things that I took on this expedition that unfortunately I wasn't able to get off the ship due to their size. Um, but hopefully we'll go on a DBO website that we're starting to try to develop that will kind of put all of this data in a place that's really easy to find and, and user friendly, like I mentioned. And I'm also working with a number of other researchers that were on this ship and they've been giving me data and pictures and other things that I'm compiling that will be, I'll be able to use on this website. And the whole idea is to give teachers the resources and students the opportunity to see how this ecosystem is connected by all of these different things. So atmospheric, ocean temperatures, um, ocean acidification, the benthic organisms, how all of that is connected together. Um, I've also had, I also live uh, on the ocean, which is really great. Um, and so I have really been focusing on having students do comparative studies, um, especially in my classroom. Uh, and I have the opportunity to work with a number of nonprofits in the area as well. And so uh, the Seaco Science Center, the New England Aquarium um, are both places that I have uh, pretty strong relationships with and I'm working with them to incorporate some of this stuff into their uh, displays and into their curriculum that they give out to teachers and educators. And so I'm working with them to do that. Um, I've been doing a lot of outreach um, with them doing like STEM days and things like that. Um, and I th and, and uh, Lee and I are also going to be going to the Ocean Sciences meeting in San Diego in February. So we have that coming up that we're working on some um, uh, presentation for that. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, we have a lot going on. So anything else you want to add there, Lee? Um, no, I think you've covered it very well. Um, uh, I'm trying to set up a, uh, a lab uh, visit uh, for Piper and then a, another teacher who's been a, 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 an alumnus of, uh, of Polar Trek who lives about an hour away uh, also wants to, uh, to come. And um, so Deanna and I met recently uh, at a, a dedication of a, a new marine sanctuary on the Potomac River. So we're talking too. So I'm hoping to bring that together. And it's just been busy. I just was on the Healy last Friday, getting our gear off of it and uh, mm -hmm. shipping it back and uh, went up to uh, British Columbia to get Canadian samples and walk them across the border into back into the US. So it's been a busy, uh, uh, this fall's been busy for travel. So, but I'm trying to set up uh, some time or some daylight that uh, 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 Piper can come down and see our lab here. And, uh, and we may do that either in January or in February around the time of the, uh, the San Diego meeting. Mm -hmm. yeah cool yeah. very good well very nice to uh see and hear about all your connections and i love that your one of your main objectives is just trying to make data more accessible to others <laughs> that's a that will be a feat for sure especially with all the data that uh this cruise always collects so yeah what the thing we're doing with the videos that Pi, uh, at least some of the videos we we've collected we've got seafloor videos of all of the distributed biological observatory stations and so one idea we're kicking around is maybe we could get uh, students to look at uh, individual image frames count animals and that we do it every year so to to see are the animals changing size are there more we are seeing fish moving north in into the areas we haven't seen them before it's like you know they're showing up on the video so there's there's a lot of interesting and exciting things happening uh, big changes going on in the whole ecosystem. So that's sort of the underpinning of the whole science. Yeah, and Katie was asking, how do we get to see the videos? Um, what I, um, I, yeah, I guess what I need to do is I need to send out, I'll send out to everybody, if you'd like to see them, uh, some links. Uh, there's full, there's, there's a, if you do, 
probably the easiest way is do a search on YouTube for distributed biological observatory. Uh, and the last couple of years are the first thing are are one of the first things that shows up uh, in the link. So go to youtube.com uh, and do that search for distributed biological observatory and you can find some highlight reels. We've also got full 10 minute tapes at each station uh, that we occupy each year uh, uh, and they're on a Google Drive and I can give that address to any uh, those addresses to anybody uh, who would like it. I just, uh, we just uploaded the edited uh, 2019 tapes. Okay, cool. All right, thank you, um, Piper and Lee. We're gonna move uh, backwards in time. Mm -hmm. and I'll just like, mm -hmm. oops, a quick sorry. question of Piper and Lee first. Yes, yes, go ahead. Just curious, you had a timeline of when you data would be up because that sounds like something my students to work on and use with comparative studies with some studies that they do similarly in our salt marsh and off of our coast here. Will that be available through the Distributed Biological Observatory um, website? Yeah. Yeah, oh, go ahead, Lee. yeah, go ahead uh, uh, Piper. Oh, I was just going to say, so the, the website, the current website right now does have data that you can use. Um, it just, there's no curriculum that goes with it and it's a little clunky. It's kind of hard to find and especially, um, you know, like I have high school students and they have sometimes had a hard time with it. Um, so just kind of cleaning it up and making it a little easier um, to find and then manipulate in certain ways is kind of the goal. And then, so we're doing this ocean sciences meeting in February. So I'm hoping to have, uh, and I'm currently, I kind of have, I have a skeleton right now of a website, um, but I'm hoping to have something to at least show in February um, for the benthic, the benthic organism. So I'm hoping to do videos and at least, a, you know, at least a single set of data with a, with a curriculum piece that goes with it. So hopefully there will be something available to you in February. Um, and then I'm hoping that by, you know, the beginning of the 2020 school year, we'll have uh, like a com almost complete website. Um, and like I said, I've been getting data from all the other researchers on the ship as well. So I'm starting to kind of sort through those things, graphs, data, raw data, um, pictures, videos that they've sent me and trying to organize it in a way that is going to be really easy for any grade level teacher to use. Thank you. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, DJ, thanks for joining. DJ has to bug out here. So, uh, whoops. Um, and let's see, uh, Dominique, next time uh, you're on the phone, just identify yourself since <laughs> we can't see you. <laughs> um, all right, I think we're moving on to Kate and Doni. So uh, go ahead, Kate. Yeah, so um, we were up in Tulik and we were um, sampling um, these specific locations um, at certain sites for um, kind of vegetation and shrubs. And we were taking just massive amounts of biomass basically back to the, the lab at, at Tulik and um, going through sort of the, the top story and then the understory. Um, I have a, a picture right here for kind of the, what we were calling the tundra cake. So we were um, kind of taking out the, the root systems and stuff and identifying all of these plants and, and from the top, like the leaves um, and the stems um, all the way down to the root system. So that's what you see in this picture right here. And there was this massive amount of volunteers there. I think we had up to about 20 volunteers. Um, and uh, I think there was, there was multiple aspects. So this is really sort of cataloging. We were taking all of this stuff. Eventually it was gonna go into a um, oven to get dried. And then it was gonna go back to the, the lab um, at Fairbanks and um, kind of go into multiple projects. And I think there's a little bit of backlog going on um, for how much data still needs to be processed. Um, but uh, our, our focus and really what we were, um, looking at was sort of the, the nitrogen nod nodules that we were taking off of these alder plants to look at sort of what's going on with nitrogen fixation and how is the, the altering snow cover um, affecting this, this nitrogen cycle. Um, so that, that's kind of the overview of really what we were doing there. Um, I've done uh, a little bit of outreach so far. So on the, the left side over there, you can kind of see we, we had a, a staff meeting and so I was presenting sort of what I was doing there. And I was also kind of trying to sell a lot of the, um, 
the polar truck program to uh, a lot of the teachers there. And I actually think that I, I, I got a few people, people were like trying to apply while I was presenting and then they were all bummed out that they couldn't because um, uh, the, the deadline was closed. I emailed them, I told them when it was, but um, so that was uh, kind of one of my outreaches that I've been doing. I've been developing some lessons. I'm working with the math department and the biology teacher. I'm also trying to get the engineering teacher involved to see if I can get some like engineering design um, going. Um, and uh, I think our, our focus is really going to be on um, taking data and how to kind of analyze data and put it into graph and stuff. It's really something that our students uh, struggle a lot with. Um, I have uh, two schools that I'm um, in the works that I'm trying to get lined up to go do some presenting um, at a middle school and another high school. Um, I'm going to go present in the biology classroom at my school. Um, and uh, I also have a, a lesson plan that I'm developing for um, Science Friday. Oh, and I have a, a, a wine event um, my cousin came up with where we're, I'm going to present um, to uh, some parents and, and staff at another school um, involving wine. So I feel like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a lot of people with that. Um, that's been kind of my, my overview so far of kind of what I've been doing. I feel like I'm missing a lot. Um, in terms of sort of the other two speakers here, but um, let me let me know what else I can fill in there. No, yeah, it's great. I mean, it that uh, it sounds like things are progressing, and you got you got a couple of events lined up, and you did some while you were out there. And I know when we talked on the phone before, you there's data from last year that you might be able to use, and this data is still being processed. So I, I think you're in a good place, and um, and the wine event, I think we are all jealous that we can't join you. It's genius. It's genius. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come up with it. <laughs> it's all right. It's good. It's very creative. Uh, Doni, is there anything you want to add to this? Um, no, I think Kate did a good job of that. Uh, you know, we are, we have analyzed uh, the biomass data, but we haven't, we're still processing the samples for CNN content. And I think Kate and I are hoping that maybe later this year, Either she could come to Fairbanks or I could go to um, her school and maybe interact with the folks there. So that's also something that's on our, our horizon looking forward. Um, yeah, and Kate was, it was wonderful to work with Kate at Tulick. And our sites actually that we were doing this alder harvest at are quite far north of Tulick near where the foothills blend into the coastal plain. And um, we've been looking at alder growth there and and comparing that with growth of shrubs that are closer to Tulick and just one little fun fact is that some of those alders started growing in about 1870. So they're quite old for Arctic shrubs. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so Kate, uh, Katie has a fun little thing <laughs> down there about sampling grapevines for nitrogen. So let's yes. respond when we go <laughs> to the next thing. Um, yeah, that is phenomenal. Um, okay, let's move to the next slide. Um, looks like we have, um, I don't think Monica's on, but I think Craig is here and Judy might have some notes from uh, Monica as well. So Judy, Craig. Yep, I was checking to see, does Craig, do you have the, what Monica uh, wrote up? No, I don't actually. Did you want to? Oh, actually, okay. Yep, uh, yeah. on that email, actually. I think oh, that, sorry, I was looking at the PowerPoint, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to read it then? Yeah, why don't you go for it? It's at your fingertips. I'll, I'll jump in later on. Okay. Uh, Monica said, my expedition took me across various areas of North, Northern Alaska. Thanks to Dr. Tweedy, I was able to join various projects in my five weeks of being out in the field. These projects range from gathering LIDAR data to drone work in the tundra, to collecting ice cores off the coast of Northern Alaska, and even, even gathering benthic samples in the Arctic Ocean. With the amazing team that I was part of, I was able to tackle some of the harshest terrain on the planet, the unforgiving tundra. As the weeks passed by, I was extremely grateful for all the amazing researchers that took me under their wing. Now I get to share my experience with my classroom, school, and community. I've currently held pre presentations of my expedition 
with local science teachers in our region. In addition, I have the great opportunity to continue this fellowship work with my expedition team. We are right next door to each other and my students are in the process of meeting the team and even traveling to our local university where our team is currently processing all of the data that was gathered during this past field season. Thank you for everything. All right, anything you wanna to add to that, Craig? Uh, no, thanks, Julie. I, I was looking at the slide and not the text, so I appreciate you jumping in there. No, Monica was absolutely fantastic. Uh, she's uh, at a school just 20 minutes away or so from us and uh, has been in touch with the grad students in my lab in particular. And so they've got all sorts of neat ideas of not only sort of building on Monica's time with us up in Utkiavik, but also uh, Sort of building off some of the local desert projects that we're that we're part of as well so yeah she was just fantastic and uh, she's also a, a national geographic teacher and uh, i know a lot of her materials are sort of focused on sort of comparing the the polar regions so for you know kids on the us mexico border living in the desert this it's quite a i think it's quite a treat for her students to be able to sort of be role modeled by Monica and uh, kind of just experience uh, a part of the world that that is really quite alien to them. So uh, I really appreciated all that Polar Trek has, has done for Monica and, and just making it such a wonderful experience this summer. So thanks, thanks to everyone for that. Very good. Yeah, and I know she has a, um, I know she has some uh, additional um, <clears throat> events coming up as well. And, and so, yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about those when she sends those things to us. Um, yeah, it's nice to have that connection, like you said, uh, Craig, with the, the desert, which is its own extreme environment and the polar regions and, and do that comparison contrast between the, the two. Yeah, so. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much, Janet and Judy. I appreciate all, all you've done for us. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to relay about Monica's um, expedition, and in case you have audiences, um, everybody's journals are archived, so you can always use anybody's uh, journals from any of these expeditions as part of your teaching. Um, and in your teachings, I guess I should say. And Monica did hers in uh, Spanish and in English. So uh, that's another um, set of resources that you can use. So if you're interested in having something that's in Spanish um, about the Arctic, use Monica's journals. And uh, so she did a nice job of doing bilingual journals. Yeah, I just got a text from her. She may be joining us in a few minutes, but uh, okay. I think we should just keep pushing forward. So yeah, yeah we can come back and have her if she wants to relay anything more. Or okay. Sure. okay. Yeah, that sounds terrific. Thanks so much. Yep. Thanks. Um, okay. It looks like we've moved on to, where are we? Um, oh, this is Amanda's uh, slide. So Amanda's not here tonight. So Judy, would you like to fill in um, for Amanda? Yep, uh, Amanda wrote, um, I apologize for my absence. I am currently on a flight. I'm getting married this Saturday. <laughs> my current outreach includes redistributing winning flags that have been flown in Siberia, visiting Saratoga elementary and high school classrooms to teach about larch tree recruitment and distribute Russian candy. I purchased enough for every student to repeat, receive a piece. I have been invited to present at the public library and I am coordinating the District National Geographic Geography B and will share information about the Siberian Arctic at the start of the B. All right. That's from Amanda. All right. Very good. And I don't think her researcher is with us tonight either. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's move on. It looks like we have Allie and uh, Team Oberbauer. Hi, <laughs> again. Um, so I uh, went to Barrow, uh, Alaska, and uh, I was there for two weeks. And then uh, we took like a day and a half trip uh, to Akasuk. And then I spent three weeks at Tulik. 
Um, so what we were doing is we were looking at vegetation um, and the change in the vegetation, the phenology uh, of the vegetation and how climate change is affecting it. Um, and so when we were in Barrow, uh, it was a lot of setup and that sort of thing. And I got to see a lot of the, the GVSU team and how they work and you know how they started um, looking at the vegetation and they're very meticulous about it. I really admire that about them. And uh, then uh, when we uh, went to Agastic, it was also just a little bit of a setup. And uh, then Tulik, I feel like I really got into the science and everything um, and got to learn a lot about, from, about everything from Jeremy. Um, it was really great because I could ask all these questions and I never felt stupid about asking questions. Um, and they, it was just a, a really great experience. Um, and uh, they're looking, uh, so they're, they compare uh, different vegetation plots and uh, some of them have uh, what's called an open top chamber on them and they're looking at how the vegetation is you know uh, maturing uh, throughout the season and you know when it's flowering and, the, and that sort of thing and they're comparing control plots to the open top chamber plots and it's a really awesome way and i think a really cool way to teach that to my kids you know to teach controls and and that sort of thing and I learned all about greenness and um, the mist uh, tram system that they um, use. And so it was a really, really awesome experience. Um, Jeremy can tell you a little bit more about the science and, and that sort of thing. Um, to start off with, I, I created a video to uh, promote the uh, expedition. And then my school district also uh, promoted uh, or made a video as well and, and promoted it. I collected flags from of about 10 classrooms uh, across the district and I took the flags with me and some of them got flown and featured in the um, in, in the journals, um, but all of them traveled to the Arctic. So I made these little stickers for the flags and I put a sticker on all of them. And then I also did like a cartoon where the kids could draw themselves in a, a mosquito shirt. And I put stickers on those too. And they, the sticker says my uh, drawing travel to the Arctic and I gave it back to the kids and so they were really excited about their flags and their drawings getting featured and then uh, returned back to them that had made the trip with me. Um, just recently there was a business, there's uh, the Eagle Pass Business Journal, it's a big newspaper in town, they did an article uh, about my expedition and so people are like oh you were the one that was in the newspaper and my mom has like, I didn't keep any hard copies of it, my mom has a bunch of hard copies of it. Um, so uh, my, we, I was at a meeting today and my principal introduced me at the meeting and he said that I was in that newspaper. It was really embarrassing, but it was really good that it got out there and they, um, you know, the, the town got to, to learn about the expedition. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, I've got plans to go visit schools. I'm talking to a kindergarten teacher, which I'm really kind of scared to talk to little itty bitty kids about this <laughs> because, um, but it's going to be exciting and, and interesting on, you know, how to explain uh, the, what I've been doing uh, out there uh, to them. And then uh, I also have plans to visit elementary classrooms and high school classrooms. And hopefully this is gonna, um, this is gonna happen before Jeremy comes out because we have plans for Jeremy to come visit Eagle Pass. And I wanna kind of do like a, um, like a day, like he's gonna do like a day in the classroom with me on like a Friday. And then I wanna do like, you know, go out into the field on a Saturday and have the kids like meet us somewhere like at a park or something where we can look at vegetation. Um, and I had this idea that, uh, I haven't talked to Jeremy about this, but um, it would be really cool if we maybe could start like planting, because we talked about the kids actually doing phenology and, and recording, you know, what's happening with the plants on a daily basis. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we like grew something and like staggered when we planted them. So that way when Jeremy got here, they would be like in different stages and I don't know if that's going to work or be a total disaster, but um, we'll see. Uh, while I was out there, I collected tons of lichens and mosses and we're finally starting life science. We finished our physics unit and everything um, just last week. And so on Monday, we started talking about cells and I'm really excited to look for water bears in the mosses and, and stuff. And um, the kids are going to be really excited about that because they are obsessed with water bears. They're always obsessed with water bears every year. Um, and uh, so, so that's something that's kind of happening 
uh, pretty soon. I'm uh, working on lesson plans and things like that. And I'm really glad that other people have not finished theirs because I have not finished mine. And I need to talk to Jeremy about getting data um, so that I can kind of, I started on them and they're kind of like halfway done. And then I just need to kind of add stuff to it and show it to Jeremy and, and get feedback uh, on that. Um, and then tomorrow I leave for Dallas to go to CAST. So I'm going to tell all these Texas teachers about Polar Trek and I'm going to talk about my expedition, you know, what I did and what I learned and how I'm going to bring it into my classroom and also encourage them to apply um, next year, you know, and, and um, a lot of teachers are reluctant to apply for things like this. And so I'm hoping to inspire them to um, take the leap and, and see what they can do and, and learn out there. So I'm, I'm really excited and nervous about my presentation on Friday morning. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, there, we'll hopefully get some more Texas teachers applying for, for Polar Trek. Yes, that's always good. Wow, Ali, you're uh, very busy there. And it, while you were chatting, I don't know if you saw it, but Katie um, said that the kinders will love you and slow-mo. I agree. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, and with uh, tardigrades, um, there, definitely check out uh, YouTube videos, Polar Trek Channel YouTube videos, and, and um, some of the, you can just even search it uh, through the Polar Trek website because we've had a, uh, several teachers that have focused specifically on that subject. Yeah, I saw, I saw that there was a lesson that was written about it and we tried to use the microscope at Tulik to see if we could find them, but we had technical issues with the microscope. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited to get the, to like actually pull this stuff out and start getting it under some of our microscopes and make the kids do all the work. Like y'all try to find them, you know, so that, that'll be fun. Very good. All right. Um, does uh, Jeremy or Steve, would you like to add to her presentation or comments or anything? Um, I would just say that obviously it was fantastic to have Ali up there with us this year. Um, and also she got the, she got the opportunity to see the two sides of working in the Arctic, one being how smoothly everything runs at Tulik, and then the how not smoothly things can run when you're traveling between Barrow and Akasuk. So she kind of got a the, the best of the cross section across things. And I'm excited to go to Texas um, late winter, early spring, and see her classroom, and especially to do the Saturday walk around very good. Yeah. yeah, we look forward to hearing more about that experience. Should be fun. Um, anybody have questions so far uh, with any of the presenters? I kind of forgot about that earlier on or with this one. It's hard to look at chat. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. We'll move on to the next uh, presentation. Actually, I think this might be our last one. Um, is it our last one, uh, Judy? Dave was yes. here. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you speak for Dave and team. Okay. Uh, he had a fair bit to say, so bear with me. Um, my main three outreach audiences were one, my students, two, my colleagues, three, the local Austin community. One, regarding my students, I found Instagram to be the best way to reach out Yay reach them over the summer. Before school let out, I engaged my students in helping me set up an Instagram account for my trip and obtain their feedback on types of posts they would enjoy. Lead up, leading up to, during, and following my trip, I maintained contact with my students through regular photo posts, video posts, and quiz challenges. I also used Instagram to advertise for my journal entries and Polar Connect event. One of my iMovies was picked up by the Dig web crawler and currently has over 2,500 views on YouTube. My main form of future outreach for my students will be through my lesson plans, which I am finishing currently and planning to implement in the spring. Number two, regarding my colleagues, I was able to present at our before school professional development training in August. 
Through this, I was able to talk to my colleagues about the science I learned, my ideas for implementation into my classroom, and the benefits of the Prolotrek program. The session was well attended and many of my colleagues were very interested in the science and plan on applying to the program in the future. And number three, regarding my community, my best form of outreach has been via news outlets. Prior to my trip, I was able to get three stories in the local Austin news, TV and print. The stories focused on the Polar Trek program, my plans for integrating the work into my classroom and student involvement. For one of the stories, the news team allowed a small group of my students to participate and came to film at my school. During my stint at Tulick Field Station, I spent quite a bit of time recording an audio journal documenting different aspects of the research for KUT, the Austin NPR affiliate. Upon my return, they used these clips along with interview clips to create a full length radio broadcast. They ended up publishing it with a companion video piece for which they came to my school and recorded me teaching a lesson and preparing an experiment. Most of my students and their families were able to hear the story on the radio on the way to school in the morning. This piece was well received in the Austin community and I have been getting frequent emails from other teachers and professionals in the area about my experience. Most recently, the Association of Texas Professional Educators got wind of the story and included a snippet on my trip in their seasonal magazine. That's it. Awesome. Wow, thank you, Judy, for sharing. Um, I don't think we have uh, anyone from his team. So um, uh, let's see, I saw Monica, you just joined us a little bit ago. Uh, Judy read what you had sent and Craig kind of filled in. Is there anything you wanna add or do you wanna say hello? <laughs> oh. Janet, you wanna move back her slide to her slide? Yeah, I'll try to get back to, oh, sorry, Craig's, uh, or David's um, thing keeps wanting to play there. Okay, there's slide, Monica. Are you there, Monica? You're muted. muted. Maybe not? I can't unmute. Can you unmute, Janet? Yeah, I can. Are you there, Monica? Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> oh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm in the middle of parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Judy read what you had sent by email, and uh, Craig talked about uh, some of the things, you know, you guys, um, um, yeah, working together and, and his perspective of everything. So didn't know if you wanted to add anything or give us an update or... Yes, my experience has been just extremely, it was amazing, five weeks out in the field and uh, being able to... Uh, Craig's team was so amazing and so gracious and, and so many people coming and going throughout those five weeks that I was able to jump on so many different projects from NASA above, from LTER, and really get a, a vast variety of what it is to uh, be a field researcher up in Northern Alaska. And I have so many um, things that I can now contribute into my classroom that, and plans to incorporate NGSS driven lessons that relate directly to what's happening out in the field uh, in my uh, high school science class. So everything's just been amazing and I, I've been able to share my experiences not just with my school and my students but teachers in my district and even teachers in the El Paso, Texas region. So one of my um, biggest lookouts for is just trying to expand it to the state of New Mexico in upcoming conferences. So I, I really want to be able to give other teachers this um, opportunity to, to be a Polar Trek fellow and see how it just drives your own teaching practice further. Very good. Um, yeah, do you want to comment on the challenges or successes or I don't even know um, about <laughs> 
you did because you I mentioned while you were gone that you had done uh, journals both in English and Spanish. Yes. So, um, did you find that that helped or didn't help or, you know, you don't know? <laughs> no, it did. It did. Um, being able to do it in both languages. I had teachers in my district who teach primarily, um, you know, English language learners that have just arrived from Mexico and they were able to share those experiences with their students as well as um, I had uh, other teachers from the National Geographic Educator Network that were uh, from Mexico that were keeping up with the Polar Trek stories just because they were available in Spanish to them. So I was even reaching some teachers in Mexico that would send me emails and say, you know what, it's just been amazing that I've been able to um, have this experience with you and we look forward to reading your journals and it, it's, it's great that, that you have them in both languages for us. So, so that was really special. Um, yeah, some of the challenges was it does take me twice as long to process everything. Um, being able to think about what I'm gonna write that day and then being able to translate it into Spanish. And on top of that, being able to do it properly. That, that's a challenge in itself. Like, what is the way to properly write it in Spanish, you know, for it? an audience in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine it would be. Um, yeah, your time is condensed and then also uh, ideas and terms don't always translate well. So especially science kind of concepts that can be a challenge as well. Yes, and, and I'm really excited to continue to work with Craig and his team. I mean, they're right next door. And so I'm going to have my students go over to the lab and now look at we, we gathered information and data in the team and now seeing how it gets processed in the lab. So the journey that this data is going to take from when you collect it now to the lab and, and how it's going to be processed into, you know, what the research is going to look like. I think that's extremely important for students to understand that it's a timely process. Many researchers spend their entire lives studying, you know, their particular fields and, and you know it's years upon years of, uh, of work and data to come up with the solutions to the problems that they're facing. All right cool thanks for sharing and I'm glad you were able to join us in between <laughs> your conferences. Thank you. Um, all right let's see we're gonna speeding through here. Um, all right so we want to hear some more from you. Um, about uh yeah just kind of i sent out some questions before um to the educators to kind of think about and for the uh researchers um behind the scenes what happens at the orientation is um a lot of paperwork i think <laughs> the teachers and educators feel like but um there's a reason for all of our processes and the idea is to actually have tools so that the uh educators can walk away from this experience and kind of know how to use it in their in their career. And so um, we have during the training in Fairbanks when they all came up, uh, one of the processes we went through in addition to just how to journal and what life's gonna be like in the field is uh, education outreach planning. And um, I think you can see from tonight, if, from, if you could have heard what the educators were all saying during that week of training and thinking how they were going to use this experience and see what they are doing with it now, it's, we are like way down the road. They have progressed so much and how they talk about your science is, is way different than what they said during that one week in Fairbanks, what they thought was your science and how they were going to use that science. We're completely different uh, places. Um, I think they might all agree about that. <laughs> um, so what they've learned uh, from going out in the field with you um, and how to take that back in is part of the tools that we give them. Um, so we, not only do we talk about outreach, but we also uh, want them to look at how um, they might use this and you've heard lesson plans, you heard Katie talk about you creating different, um, like actually uh, workshops on, on how to uh, bring science or how to do education outreach with scientists and also community-based monitoring. So you've heard a lot of different ideas. 
Um, I think from the project management side of things, we would like to hear from the educators and even researchers um, just some of the challenges. Uh, Monica, you just mentioned one. Some of the challenges that you ran across in doing these outreach and and or the research while you're out in the field, and also how you're transferring it into your learning settings. Um, if there's any challenges that we can address as a group and help you work through. Um, I know there was somebody, I think it was Ollie, he said you were, you know, I'm happy I'm not the only one that's having issues with lesson plans, you know, you know timing, <laughs> work and life, those are all challenges. So is there something that uh, Arcus can do to help um, either streamline our, our, um, our requirements or help you in the near future to make it through um, these processes? We wanna hear about that. Um, and I think we'll, I'll just stop with that. Let's just hear from you. And I'm going to actually stop sharing the screen so that we can have a real chat here. So anybody want to comment about that? Or I know STEM, uh, we also mentioned that uh, all products need to be NGS aligned and STEM focus. Is anybody having challenges with those kinds of things and needs more guidance? Um, I'm hearing also little people voices in the background. But it's probably Monica's world. Yes, yes. Uh, there's parent-teacher conferences going on or all around me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> this this isn't necessarily something that um, Arcus can help with, but one thing that I didn't really sort of think about in my timeline of when I returned is that I'm down here in Washington um, working remotely right now, which means I'm not working directly with our after school programs and our busy season is really late spring, summer and fall. Um, that's when I have access to working with a lot of students and also with a lot of teachers. And so um, in some ways it's really nice because it gives me time to really think through what I want to be doing. But there are other times where I'm like, I just want to have a group of kids. <laughs> I just want to share them with this while, it, you know, while it's still really fresh and exciting. Um, and so I have some teacher friends down here in Washington that I've been kind of poking to see if I can come in and work with their classes or work with their after school programs or things like that. But um, in order to scratch that itch, itch, I need to get a little bit more creative in the short term. And then I think long term, again, it will be kind of nice to have things more polished before I'm thrown into working with kids. It's sort of the opposite challenge that probably most other people are having right now, trying to balance teaching with writing the lesson plans. Yeah, I think personally for me is um, our state just adopted the NGSS standards. So we are in the process of creating the curriculum, the pacing guides, everything from, from the ground up. So to me, the lesson planning, like, like the way that our district is planning it out, a lot of the climate change research that we're doing is in the spring because we're trying to develop units as they go. And, and that's been the biggest challenge is like sitting down and being like, okay, I need to work on the Polar Trek stuff because um, right now I'm currently working on my district curriculum and trying to balance that out has been quite a challenge, you know, for me personally with this new adoption. Okay. Uh, the, the, so, I mean, beforehand, I was super nervous about, you know, technology stuff and, you know, being ready for the field and everything. But then after we went to orientation, everything just seemed so easy. Um, Cause you guys like gave us, you know, checklists and things. I'm, like, I'm a checklist person. So I knew exactly what I needed to do. So that was really helpful. And then, you know, everybody, like there was people answering our questions and like, Jeremy was really great about, you know, letting me know what I need to take and everything. And so that was like the super easy part. And I feel like now it's kind of the hard part because we're trying to manage, you know, work and teaching and everything. And then also like, I want to make really good quality products for you guys because I'm so grateful for this experience and I'm kind of nervous that, that you know this isn't going to be good enough and how can I make it better kind of thing and then 
Um, in Texas, Texas is like backwards and we're not allowed to use NTSS. Um, and so, cause, cause of course, like whatever the state came up with is better. Right. Um, but, um, you, so I'm a little nervous about connecting it to NGSS because I'm not that familiar with it. Um, but I feel like the stuff that me and Jeremy came up with when we were, uh, in the field is really cool stuff because, you know, I'm, I'm, we're looking at like the kids actually having to, you know, grow their own plants and, and observe them and, and then looking at thaw depth over several years. And it's just really cool stuff that I think will really bring it home because, you know, they may not think that they're seeing climate change here at home, although we have like, you know, flooding and things that happen and like it snowed last year and um, they, you know, they're all like, well, is it going to snow this year? And I'm like, I had to wait 30 years for that snow. You know, it's not supposed to snow here. <laughs> um, so it's, it's going to be, uh, challenging and interesting. And I'm excited about bringing it into my classroom, but I'm a little scared about the whole NGSS thing. And I'm, I, I feel like I should, maybe I should have already had this finished already and, and, and already turned into you guys. And I feel really bad that I don't. Um, but I also don't want to do anything halfway or, or, you know, give you something that's not the best that I can do. We appreciate your thoroughness. Um, I just pushed out a, a quick little note. So there's this whole alumni, and I know there is a couple of alumni, um, and Sarah can, and maybe Judy can back me up, but I think Regina Brinker in particular is very knowledgeable about NGSS and um, she'd be happy to review anything so I would use you know if you can't if you don't remember that today just say you said so and so and we'll put you in contact with them so for all of you that are doing some kind of products and you aren't familiar with NGSS or that's just not your school um, you know uh, that's a, a key thing on transference is having that connection to NGSS so we're gonna ask you even if it, Texas is like Alaska wow. behind the curve um, you know we'll have you at least uh, yeah put them in there and um, I'm sure Regina can really review that and help you yeah improve. Regina's oh, been keeping in that. touch and she follows slow-mo and she's like sent slow-mo stuff and she sent me stuff for my classroom like for like she's been, yeah, Regina's great. So I'll reach out to her, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I'm correcting myself. Alaska is finally, after many, many years, decades of not being aligned with anything really in particular. Um, yeah, okay, let's see. Anybody else have thoughts, uh, comments? Challenges um, that they're running across in transference? I. I wanted to jump in and just echo kind of what all I said, which was like, I really want to make sure that I'm delivering good lessons. And so I have a, a lot of, of guilt for not getting these lessons to you guys yet, but I'm also <laughs> kind of slowly working through kind of how I'm going to um, kind of process all of that and, and put it into a lesson. And then I have this other sort of issue of a, like, I'm teaching chemistry, um, but a lot of the sort of application that I was doing out there was very biology based. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to make too work, too much work for myself um and trying to make a lesson plan that's not for my class so i'm trying to figure out how to balance that but um that's it's definitely something that i can get over um <laughs> so uh yeah i'm definitely feeling the guilt for not getting those lessons out there earlier sorry no it's all right i we we can empathize with you on that that, that you want to do them right and i think that's the key but um at the same time and maybe researchers don't have as much of a say about this or I don't know. I'm um, sorry. Dog chaos in my background. Try to ignore. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know from the researchers if there's a particular product or something that you need that's, um, you know, that helps define your research better or if you've ever even looked at the lessons. I know a couple of researchers have really, um, like David's team in particular, Rose Corey, really likes the lessons that uh, get produced by uh, the, the educators there because she uses them with her undergrads because of the level of the lessons, but that's not an expectation we have for everybody, but um, I don't know if researchers have thoughts about that. I'll be honest, I haven't looked at them yet, but I would definitely, I'll do that now. 
I was a bit distracted earlier this fall because my husband got a new hip and so I was helping him get better. But yeah, I think it's great to potentially incorporate them into classrooms if, if it seems reasonable. Okay, anybody else? I mean, I think for me, I mean, I, I can echo a lot of what everybody else said, but for me, I know it's prioritizing. I came back with so much information um, that I have so many ideas for lessons and it's kind of like, okay, I only, you know, really get one shot a year. Um, and a lot, like I think another teacher had just mentioned, like a lot of the curriculum that I would implement happens in the spring for me as well. Um, so I won't really get to try it out until the spring um, just because our curriculum restricts us with that. Uh, but then, you know, it's like, okay, what can I put together in the spring versus like, you know, I have some ideas for some engineering curriculum, I'm going to need help with that. Um, so I'm going to have to like prioritize my thoughts um, and try to figure out when I'm going to be able to get certain pieces of the curriculum that I want to do. Um, just because, yeah, I have like curriculum ADD with all of this information. So, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, so for me, it's prioritizing. Okay. Well, yeah, that's good to hear what you guys are going through. Not that I have a solution for everything, but I think if you start to get too much anxiety about it, please let us know before long. Uh, we'll work with you on what is, what is useful, what is not useful, and if it's turning out that it's not a useful process for you, um, you know, we'll have to think of something um, that is useful. Uh, the reason for lessons in particular, which doesn't apply so much to uh, Katie, but um, because they can produce a, a variety of products, but um, lessons um, are, you know, hopefully you would use something uh, in your classroom. That's the first thing. It's for you to use in your classroom and, and a way for you to share the experience that most administration um, school districts like to see. And it's in a, a way that, yeah, you can use it. But if that's not the uh, kind of product or you're uh, you aren't getting support from administration to do that kind of thing. We don't want it to be um, You know not 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 a, a burden. It should be really working into your um, Into what you are already doing for work. So connect with Judy and me about that if you're struggling um, And then the other requirement this year that uh, and NSF really wanted um, was that connection between informal science ed and formal educators. Um, so again, like, um, you know, just ha what happened tonight, Allie was talking about, I'm going to a kindergarten classroom and Katie is like, hey, you'll be great, you know, but if you have some more, <laughs> Not, that is supportive. Um, if you have some more, um, you know, uh, concrete tips about what that looks like or things um, that um, could help you, whichever learning, um, learning place you're, or learning audiences that you're working with, you know, let's try to connect the informal educators with the uh, formal educators a little bit more or just let us know that you need to connect and we'll, we'll try and review your work you know, or give pointers. Um, DJ was on here earlier. Dominique is on, maybe still. Um, we got Katie. Um, Sarah's working with all the informal educators as well. So there's a number of, of good contacts out there. So if you're in formal education and you're trying to figure out how to, you know, really get that uh, present, that wine event going or those places that you aren't very familiar with other outreach opportunities like libraries or groups um, or even STEM after school programs um, and you aren't really sure how to connect, let's use those alumni for um, and those resources. Um, and the idea too is that the lessons or activities that you put together can also be used in other um, other learning settings, so even outside of the classroom, hopefully. So, um, Janet? Yeah, go ahead. Real quickly, I, I was thinking of this earlier and then you sort of, sort of mentioned it again, but I'm in a pretty fortunate position where I'm familiar with quite a few different um, sort of uh, informal education curricula, uh, as well as curricula for educator for K-12 education in Alaska um, around like climate change 
and especially coastal ecology, but also some terrestrial ecology. So also, as you all are working on lesson plans, if you're finding that you just wish there was more kind of easy background information or an intro activity that you could plug in or some sort of extension, um, I've got a lot of them sort of stored in my brain because I'm doing actually some NGSS realignment of a couple curricula this winter. Um, so I'm happy to be a bit of a human database, I guess, for you if there's something that you're, you're wishing you had access to but don't know how to find it. Um, I'm happy to try to help and it looks like Sarah is too. And since um, we both have worked in Alaska, it will probably be similar to most of the ecosystems that you all were, were working in. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good point. And thanks, Sarah, for stepping up on that. Um, likewise, if it's uh, dealing with um, citizen science or community based monitoring or culturally responsive education, um, I can review stuff for that. So, um, one other thing I will add is my other contract work right now is writing climate change NGSS curriculum for middle school science in California. And I wrote the entire unit on ecosystems. And so for that NGSS stuff, I've got some of those particular performance expectations, sort of if you're, if you're working on something and it's related to something in ecosystems, you know, send me a note and I can help you find those um, NGSS performance expectations and all those other pieces. BCIs and all that stuff. Cool. I'm sure all the researchers are like, what the heck are you all talking about, people? It's okay, it's important stuff, um, guaranteed. Um, so let's see, um, is there, um, let's see, the other things, and, and we'll wrap up here real, sh real quickly. The other things I sent out to the group to kind of digest or think about, was networking. Um, sounds like you're all doing pretty good on that. So um, I am, unless you have some particular areas that you're interested or struggling with, let me know. Um, and outreach, it sounds like everybody, based on what you were presenting, you also have some upcoming outreach activities. All of you mentioned one thing or another. Um, I think with the outreach, um, my particular interest is not just to do outreach for the sake of doing outreach, it's great, but also to kind of assess whether it's being impactful. So if any of you are looking for tools along those lines um, or questions about how to ex um, assess your outreach, um, probably Katie, again, probably has some of that background. Um, I certainly have background in that. Um, anybody else? that's on tonight that has, um, yep, Sarah. So again, if you're doing some kind of outreach activity and you're not really sure how to assess whether you're being impactful or not, and this includes, you know, just your library presentations, your wine event, all those things, um, tap us for our tools because it's really helpful to find out, get feedback as to whether that was a good activity or not, or, you know, you're really getting the message that you want across. Um, so just kind of put that out there. But um, was there any other particular issues or challenges or things, um, support questions that anyone had or been thinking about? Everybody on the East Coast is asleep. OK. Um, just a reminder, I know some of you already have this in your plans, but we do have funding again to um, make those connections where you go see the researcher or researchers if you want to go to uh, the schools or, or whatnot. I know some of you have already got that going, but if you um, uh, need support for that kind of um, collaboration and networking, um, where we definitely have the funding for that. I know, I don't know, is anybody in this group going to AGU? No, how about, uh, I think it was Piper and Lee are doing the ocean sciences one. Anybody else doing that? Uh, this is and, Craig, I'll be at AGU, so. Oh, okay, but you will be, but Monica won't be. No. I'll, I'll be at AGU also, um, Janet. Okay. 
Yep, there's uh, Arcus is having their reception, their Arctic reception for there. And then I got a full suite of education things. So I, I anticipate seeing Craig and Donnie in the background. No. <laughs> I'm sure I'll run into you somewhere and Judy will be there as well. Um, NSTA, I know Katie, is that anybody else doing NSTA? Okay. Um, we got Texas conference. Yeah. Well, so those are in other opportunities. If a professional, um, we were talking about, um, I think it was Katie was talking about environmental education earlier in her things and there's citizen science as well. But uh, there's a couple of good conferences centered around environmental education and citizen science um, that aren't normal places for researchers or educators to this group to normally attend, but they are really, um, your, everybody's team here could probably do a presentation at some of those uh, conferences. So kind of think about those if you see them coming up. And the, the nice thing about those conferences is they're typically during the summertime. So um, not so great for the researchers, but great for the educators. Um, and Sarah, do you want to elaborate on what you just said in the chat box? Yes, stir the rice for five minutes. Um, uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah. When you submit your outreach in the documentation, if you can just sort of, I don't know, it is pretty clear usually, but if you want to just write informal science education event or something, I can use that to say, look, all I went to a, a, a museum and did a presentation and that interaction of, of engaging with your local informal science education community is a, a great thing for us to keep track of as well. Good. Thank you. And so, Sarah, just to clarify, by that you mean anything that happens outside of a K-12 classroom? Yeah, so if you are a formal classroom teacher and you go somewhere that is not really a formal classroom, then that would generally count as informal, uh, an informal setting. <laughs> Yes. And Katie, whatever you put, and if you put like K-12 classroom or something, I will know that that's yep. your interaction. Yep. The opposite. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, uh, any, well, <laughs> we'll let you go back to stirring rice. Um, I'm sure you aren't the only one that has things to do. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, it was great hearing from all of you. Good work. I'm always amazed at, like I said, I wish I could take the little snippet of you all trying to describe your research project and where you were going that week in Fairbanks and then like re replay it for you at this moment because it's astounding how different you are um, when you come to speaking about that science and how much you clearly have learned. So good job, kudos to all the researchers for taking the educators out there to begin with. We couldn't do it without you obviously and um, to all the all of you educators going with open minds and um, really sucking up all of that knowledge into your head and it's just fun to see what you're doing with it and what you're thinking so um, hopefully this was useful to all of you and uh, we look forward to working with you some more um, we'll do another we probably won't have another virtual one until late spring when we'll get everybody back together and uh, both regions and see how where we are then. So in the meantime, thanks again for joining us and good night. Okay. Good night. Thank Hi. you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks Kate. Good to see you again. It was good to see you too.